All right, buckle up. We're diving into the world of acid house parties this time. Oh yeah. This is gonna be a wild ride. You know it. I've got a stack of British newspaper clippings here, mostly from the late 80s and early 90s. Looks like we're about to uncover a cultural phenomenon. More than just music, though. These parties really shook things up. We're talking a full-on cultural clash. A clash. Oh, yeah. A whole generation craving freedom, new experiences, all fueled by this new sound, acid house music. And, of course, you've got the authorities freaking out about well, everything. Drugs, safety, the whole shebang. From what I'm seeing in these articles, these weren't your grandma's tea parties. Not unless your grandma was throwing raves in warehouses. Right. Imagine thousands of people dancing in these huge, often abandoned spaces or even fields. All to this pulsating hypnotic music. They even had a name for these gatherings. Acid house parties. Yeah. Catchy, right? Definitely left a mark. And the music was key. We're talking pulsating strobe lights cutting through a dry ice smoke screen. That's a direct quote. Sounds intense. Oh, it was. Imagine a beat described as one beat boom, 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 boom all the time. Can you hear it? I can practically feel it. No wonder the media at the time went a little, shall we say, dramatic. Oh, absolutely. Headlines like drugged school kids and evil Mr. Fix-its in bloody fight with riot cops. They knew how to grab your attention. And soccer thugs are using the acid house craze to bring psychedelic terror to the terraces. Talk about fear monger. It was a different time, right? Media sensationalism at its finest. But it also reveals the anxieties bubbling under the surface. This wasn't just about a new sound. It was about a whole subculture emerging, one that felt very separate from the mainstream. And they had their own way of communicating, too. One article described it as obscure, stilted, multiracial language, like they were speaking their own code. So it was bound to cause some waves. It was like they were messing with the established order and nobody likes that. Exactly. And these gatherings weren't exactly public events advertised in the local paper. Right. This movement seemed to thrive in secrecy. Makes you wonder how word got out. Pirate radio, my friend. It was the lifeblood of the acid house scene. So it wasn't just about the music. Not at all. These underground stations were connecting ravers, announcing parties, building a community. A whole other world operating right under everyone's noses. Of course, that's bound to make the authorities nervous. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Especially since these parties weren't exactly known for their temperance. Right, the drugs. It mm -hmm. seems like every other sentence in these articles mentions ecstasy and cannabis. It was definitely part of the scene. And it wasn't always pretty. One article talks about youngsters were so high on ecstasy and cannabis, they ripped the birds' heads off. Their bodies lay among thousands of empty soft drink cans and pieces of foil which had contained the drugs. Yeah, that's one of the darker sides of what was happening. It definitely paints a disturbing picture. Yeah, but it's important to remember, not every acid house party was a scene of chaos. Good point. You can't paint an entire movement with a single brush. Exactly. And this movement was nothing if not diverse. Definitely dynamic. So what did the authorities do? Just try to shut it all down? Well, they certainly tried. We saw roadblocks, raids, and a real push for stricter laws. They were determined to get things under control. And it wasn't always easy. One article mentions how the police were forced to back down when they tried to break up a party with 10,000 people. Imagine that. Wow. That's a lot of people. You can't just ask them to all go home. Right. So what happened? Did the authorities just give up? Not quite. This clash was just getting started. So the authorities were really trying to clamp down on these parties, but did they ever try to understand what was driving this movement, or was it all just shut it down, shut it down? You know, it's interesting you ask that. It wasn't all hard-line crackdowns all the time. Some folks in government realized that simply banning these parties might backfire. So they were trying to get it? to understand it rather than just demonize it. It seems that way. There's this letter, right, sent to the prime minister at the time, fascinating read. It argues that the real issue wasn't the drugs, but that these events were unlicensed. Okay, interesting. So what were they suggesting? It wasn't about a free-for-all. But this letter, it actually says, drugs are not the main issue. The parties are a form of unlicensed public entertainment for which people buy tickets. Mm. So maybe some people saw a way to bring these parties into the fold you know, regulate them instead of just trying to make them disappear. So a bit of a middle ground. Did that actually lead to any changes in how the police handled things? It's hard to say for sure. There's evidence pointing both ways. Some police forces, they doubled down, more roadblocks trying to discourage attendance. 
but then in other places, you see organizers actually getting entertainment licenses. Wow, so they were allowed to have these parties legally. It seems that way, though I'm sure there were a lot of rules and regulations attached. It was a real balancing act for the authorities, trying to keep things safe, keep the peace, but also recognizing that this new cultural phenomenon wasn't going away anytime soon. Yeah, talk about walking a tightrope. And let's not forget the media's role in all of this. They weren't exactly painting a rosy picture of these parties. Oh, absolutely. Headlines like, police waited eight hours before moving in to end an all-night party. That doesn't exactly scream harmless fun, does it? And then there's this one. A tough package to curb the craze is close to completion. Sounds almost ominous, doesn't it? Definitely adds to the whole drama of it all. But it shows you how seriously they were taking it. And, you know, that kind of coverage had to influence public opinion. People probably thought twice before going to a rave after reading those headlines. You would think so. But here's the thing. Despite all the negative press, the police crackdowns, the roadblocks, these parties, they just kept happening. How do you explain that? What made this movement so resilient? It's kind of ironic, isn't it? The more the authorities tried to shut things down, the more the scene was pushed underground. And when something goes underground, it's harder to control. Right. Out of sight, out of mind. Or not, in this case. Exactly. One police officer was quoted as saying, they have no intention of applying and the parties are organized in such a way that nobody knows until the last minute where they will occur. Talk about a logistical nightmare. It became almost impossible to police. So it became this cat and mouse game. Oh, absolutely. Mm. And that only made it more appealing, more exciting, especially for young people. It's like the forbidden fruit, right? You want it even more when you're told you can't have it. And we can't forget the music, that driving beat. It was like nothing anyone had ever heard before. Absolutely. Yeah. And even when mainstream radio stations tried to shut it out, ban songs with references to Acid House, it found a home on pirate radio. These underground stations were lifelines, keeping the music alive, keeping the community connected. And that sense of community, that's powerful. These kids, they weren't just going to these parties to get high. They were going to be with their people, to listen to their kind of music, to speak their own language. So it was more than just a party. It was a movement, a cultural phenomenon. Exactly. It was about self-expression, about pushing boundaries, about finding your tribe. And that's something that often gets lost in all the sensationalized headlines and the moral panic. So what you're saying is there was more to these acid house parties than met the eye. Oh, absolutely. Way more. But we'll get into all of that after the break. It's amazing to think about the impact these parties had. I mean, we've talked about the music, the clashes with the authorities, the media frenzy. It really does feel like a pivotal moment in British culture, even now. Absolutely. And yeah. it all begs the question, what became of this whole movement? Right. Did it just fade away? It's tricky, oh, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, the peak of those crazy asset house parties, mm -hmm. that was kind of short-lived. Just a few years, really. I but have. it's impact. Right. Oh, that lasted way longer. We're still feeling it. So it didn't just disappear. It evolved. Yeah. You know? Like, imagine a seed, right? You yeah. plant it, it grows, weathers some storms, but it takes root. That's what asset house was like. It was this seed, this energy, and it just resonated. That desire for something new, for something different. And the authorities trying to shut it down just made it stronger, right? Like we were talking about earlier. Totally. And think about the music. Even with all the attempts to censor it, to keep it off the radio, it found a way. Pirate radio for the win. Right. But it wasn't just about keeping it alive. Acid house music, it became the foundation for so much more. All this new electronic dance music, it wouldn't exist without those early acid house pioneers. So those parties were like a catalyst. Totally. They sparked a whole new wave of musical creativity. And new subgenres popped up, each with its own sound, its own scene. That's how rave culture as we know it today was born. Pretty amazing to think about, right? Yeah, that is wild. From those kind of chaotic underground parties to, well, everything we see today. But I guess it wasn't just the music that had a lasting effect. You're right. Remember how we talked about how Acid House challenged the establishment? Oh, yeah. And how the authorities didn't really know what to do, how to control it. Exactly. Those challenges, they had an impact, too. It forced people to think differently about freedom of expression, about how much power the authorities should have, about what was acceptable, what wasn't. It really pushed boundaries. And not just for the people who went to those parties. Exactly. Yeah. It was bigger than all that. And, you know, we're still grappling with those same questions today, aren't we? How do we balance freedom? With safety, how much control should governments have? Yeah, it's a constant conversation. And Acid House, in its own way, it really brought those questions to the forefront. Absolutely. It's amazing, isn't it, how these parties, which 
probably seemed kind of fleeting at the time, how much of an impact they had. They changed the cultural landscape. Mm -hmm. They influenced laws, attitudes. They made people think. And that's really what it's all about, isn't it? Thinking critically, questioning, exploring new ideas, even if they make us uncomfortable. That's how we grow, right, as a society, as individuals. Well said. So as we wrap up this deep dive into acid house parties, I have one question for our listeners. Oh, let's hear it. What about today? What's happening right now that might seem like a fringe movement but could actually be the next acid house? What's going to be the cultural legacy of our time? It's something to think about, isn't it? It really is. And who knows, maybe we're living through it right now. <laughs> That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for exploring with us. Until next time, keep those minds open, keep asking questions, and most importantly, keep digging deeper.